Hi. In case you don't know me, I'm Steve, and I'm a member of Restore, and I worship at Restore Woodford, and it's my joy to talk to you today. We're following a season looking at the I am statements of Jesus in John's Gospel, and I'm going to share with you from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 7. It's the part where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So, without any more ado, John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 to 7. Let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in me also. In my Father's house, there are many resting places. Were it otherwise, I would have told you. For I'm going to make ready a place for you. And if I go and make ready a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me. That you, <coughs> that where I am, you also may be. And where I am going, you all know the way. Master, said Thomas, we do not know where you're going, so in what sense do we know the way? I am the way, replied Jesus, and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you, all of you, knew me, you would fully know my Father also. From this time forward, you know him and have seen him. This passage is one of the key texts in the Bible. It's very clear, it's very straightforward, it's very direct. There is only one way to Father God, and that is Jesus. Now, in today's culture, this is a very radical statement because we live in a very individualistic society where everybody has their own view. And the prevailing attitude seems to be, well, if it's right for you, then you have a right to live by what you consider right. And sometimes it can seem as though there are few, if any, absolutes and that everything in life is relative. So you can see how Jesus' claim to be the way, the truth, and the life is counterculture. Christians are called to live by this, and so Christians are lived, called to live counterculture. We say to the world, you are free to decide for yourself. But we know that there is only one way. There is only one truth. And there is only one person who gives life. And that person is Jesus. I'm part of a ministry school. And most Thursdays, we can be found taking part in some form of outreach in the town centre. Although there are some people who, when approached, aren't interested, there are many people who are, and who are searching for something to live by. Today, in the United Kingdom, there's a greater openness to spiritual things. So as Christians, we need to be clear about what we believe, who we believe in, and not be afraid to share the gospel. So the first challenge is, are you clear about what you believe? Are you clear about who you believe in? And then the third question to ask yourself is, so what's holding you back from sharing with others? The passage begins with Jesus talking about his death and resurrection. 
and his assurance to us, his followers, that he will return to take us to be with him in the place that he's prepared for us. Jesus seems to assume that his disciples understand what he's saying because he says, where I am going, you all know the way. But as so often in the Gospels, we see that the disciples aren't clear about what Jesus is saying. And it prompts Thomas to ask the question, we do not know where you're going. So in what sense do we know the way? If you don't know the destination, you don't know how to get there. Now, we may be tempted to roll our eyes and breathe a sigh of, at this response because these 12 people, aren't they the people who've heard Jesus teach with authority? Don't they remember his displays of power in healing the sick, casting out demons and bringing the dead back to life? Don't they remember that Jesus has told them about his death and resurrection? Well, perhaps we should cut them some slack. We have the advantage. We know the story. We know how it ends. Hindsight is a luxury that they don't have. Thinking for our, of ourselves, how many times have we been in a difficult situation or in a situation where we felt at a loss about what to do, how to react or what to say? How many times have well-meaning Christian friends not been helpful by just telling us to, oh, well, trust in God? Or by quoting Romans chapter 8, verse 28, now we know that for those who love God, all things are working together for good. It's true, but it's not always helpful. Sometimes you don't need words. You just need an arm around your shoulder. So perhaps we can sympathise with the disciples not fully understanding what's happening after all. But Thomas's reaction does demonstrate a really good point. It's okay to be unsure. It's okay not to have all the answers and not to understand everything. It's okay to have questions. It's what you do with it. And we need to be like Thomas with our questions. We need, just as he went to Jesus, we need to go to Jesus. We need to go to God the Father. And we need to ask him. God isn't phased by our questions. He's the creator of the universe. He knows each one of us individually and intimately. He knows all the answers. He's not going to say, well, let me Google and I'll get back to you. From cover to cover, the Bible is full of situations where people ask God questions. When God tells Moses the, the good news about his mission to Pharaoh, Moses asks, who am I to go to Pharaoh and bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? When the Archangel Gabriel tells Mary of God's plan and how fortunate she is to be a part of it, the text says she was deeply disturbed by these words and asked herself what this greeting could mean. And later, she voices her concerns and she asks Gabriel, but how can this come about since I'm a virgin? So if you have questions, you're in good company. The disciples, Moses, Mary, all the way through scripture, all the way through the Bible, there are people who God talks to, they're unsure and they ask God questions. God wants, to, wants you to talk with him about your questions. This passage also made me think about journeys. As we read John's Gospel, Jesus is on a journey. 
It's a journey that will ultimately lead to Jerusalem, the scene of his arrest, his trial, his death, and his resurrection. The disciples are also on that physical journey with Jesus, but not just on a physical journey. It's a journey that's challenging everything they've known and which will prepare them for continuing Jesus' mission after his death, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. We're on a journey. You could call it the journey of life. Now on this journey, we not only develop physically as we grow and get older, but we're also formed emotionally and mentally by our experiences by our friendships, by the choices that we make, by the choices that others make, and how we respond to all of these. So the next question is, how's your journey of life going? Is it like a, a bit like a train journey where you're engaged a bit, but mainly watching the scenery go by? Or does your journey of life feel like an obstacle course full of obstacles to be navigated, sometimes successfully and sometimes not so successfully? Or is it somewhere in between? Or is it a bit of both depending on the day? I've already mentioned about God wanting to talk with us about our questions. And that's just one aspect of the relationship he wants to have with us. He wants... God wants to be involved in every aspect of our lives. God wants to be involved in every aspect of your life. And he wants to have frequent communication with us. All along, right from the start, this has been the intention of the heart of God. We read it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. It says that God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And as he's walking, he's expecting to see Adam and Eve. He can't see them. So he asks them a question. Where are you? He wants relationship with them. He wants relationship with us. He wants relationship with you. He wants relationship with us and our life journeys are wherever they are, whatever our background, whatever baggage we carry. So, the next question. How do we have this kind of intimate relationship with God? Well, Jesus is very clear in this passage. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's why Jesus is the way, why Jesus is the truth, and why Jesus is the life. That's all very well if you're studying theology. But what does it mean practically? Well, God was asking Adam and Eve where they were because they were hiding. Now, it wasn't part of a game like hide and seek, Adam and Eve had let God down big time. They'd done exactly the opposite of what he told them not to do. And the rest of the Bible is about the restoration of this relationship. God tries restoration by giving laws to keep. There are detailed instructions on what and what not to do as well as detailed instructions on what and what not to eat. But it doesn't work. So, back to Mary. God intervenes personally by means of Jesus. So, how do we come to the Father through Jesus? Well, first of all, we start by recognising our need of relationship with God. And then we recognise and accept that there's nothing we can do of ourselves 
to restore this relationship. Keeping laws didn't work. <clears throat> we accept that Jesus is the only way and that he died in our place. And we recognise and we give ourselves totally to Father God. We can be sure that we're restored and not only enjoy a relationship with Father God, but also that by means of the Holy Spirit, he lives in each one of us. Our bodies have become walking, living temples. <clears throat> now it may be that as you've been listening, you're thinking, I'd like that kind of relationship with God. Well, if that's where you are, I'm inviting you to join me in a prayer right now. It may help to close your eyes. And <clears throat> as I say the prayer, <clears throat> pardon me, a phrase at a time, Repeat it after me. Father God, I recognise that I need relationship with you. I acknowledge that I am unable to do this by my own effort. I thank you <clears throat> that Jesus came and that because of his death I am able to come into your presence. Forgive me my sin. Wash me <clears throat> and cleanse me. Set me free. I submit <clears throat> every part of myself to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I say that from this time forward, I will live for you. Amen. If you've prayed this prayer along with me, then let someone know. Email Restore Community Church. The address is on the website. Connect with church and join with others who are journeying with God. For the Christian, the journey of life and the journey of faith are all one. God wants to walk with us and connect with us in the same way that he walked and connected with Adam and Eve. For the Christian, it's not about church attendance or even reading the Bible, although these are both very commendable. And I'm not saying don't do them. But for the Christian, primarily, it's about connecting and interacting with God the Father. It's about connecting and interacting with God by means of the Holy Spirit in the midst of life events, both good and not so good. It's about stepping out and living in the same way that Jesus did, knowing his power in our daily lives and knowing that our Father God walks with us. <clears throat> to finish, I'll say a prayer. So, if you're ready. Father God, thank you that I am not alone in my journey of life. Thank you that you are not a distant, far away God, but that you are interested in me 
and journeying with me through life. Let me be aware of your presence in every part of my life. I give you permission to lead and direct my thoughts, lead and direct my words, and lead and direct my actions. And let every part of my life give glory to you. Amen. Thank you.